What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another episode of the Smart Cow Moment Smack Talk Podcast. We are going to do another round here of our main event for this week, and we are going to do another Mount Rushmore. But before we get into explaining what that is, what the topic is revolving around, or anything else like that, I need to introduce who is doing the Mount Rushmore podcast. Hi, am your host as always, Tony Mango, and joining me as always, you should know these names by now. If you don't already, hey, check them out on Twitter. You've got Robert D. Felice. Hey, hey. Callum Wiggins. Howdy. And Stephen Wigo. Yo. So, Mount Rushmore. Uh, we have done seven of these before, and it is nothing related to the politics that are going on about Mount Rushmore or anything else like that at the actual moment. Instead, it, this is revolving around, of course, the Mount Rushmore of professional wrestling because this is Smart Cat Moment, and that's a pro wrestling channel. Uh, you might think otherwise when you click on some random dark casts or some... Uh, some mailbags or something like that. But yeah, we revolve around pro wrestling here. So that's what we're going to do here. And this was a suggestion from Wega when we were sitting there trying to figure out what do we actually do this week? That's why we're actually a day late too. It's because we were just like, I don't know what to do. Like there's not really a whole lot of things to revolve around. And Wega suggested, Hey, we got a lot of stuff going on with the United States title right now. MVP is claiming that he is not only the best of all time, but that he is the current champion, which he is not. That is still Apollo Crews, who's been MIA for a while due to something revolving around the coronavirus. We don't know if he has it, if he's just taking precautions. WWE doesn't really want to uh, specify exactly what that stuff is all about. But we got the United States title in the kind of forefront right now. And you know what? If we didn't have anything else really to talk about, this is the time that we can do this kind of a thing and not really have to be like all right, we, we don't have any kind of option to do that in the future down the line or something like that. So that's what we're doing here. The Mount Rushmore of United States champions, which not only sticks with the WWE side of things, but it also dates back, oddly enough, all the way through WCW past that point to NWA. It's one of the rare instances where WWE doesn't have their own lineage for a championship that they did with like the... Uh, Raw and SmackDown tag team titles, not having the tag team title lineage that goes back all the way to the original world titles. There's no like world heavyweight championship uh, was carrying over from WCW title, so on and so forth. So we've got actually 97 possible people here. We're not going to go through 97 people. That would take forever. And to be perfectly honest, I couldn't tell you a damn thing about a lot of these people. You're not going to hear a lot of arguments from me about like, well, no, see, I think that uh, that Bobo Brazil needs to be a part of the, uh, no, I couldn't tell you Kensuke Sasaki's uh, contributions to this and so on and so forth. But you know what? I think that that might be kind of fun too, because this isn't something where there's a clear cut group of 15 or so people or 10 people or five people or whatever to narrow it down. It's something that we're not as 100% able to to really dive into like these different aspects the way that we would with some of the other things. So I don't know. We'll see how this goes. And uh, obviously, I invite everybody listening to join in on the discussion, at least uh, as far as your end goes. So that means to drop a comment below. And if you're listening to us on a platform that does not have a comment section, then the best thing for you to do is to hop over to the YouTube channel because that one does. While you're over there, hit the like button on the video, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already, and ring that little notification bell to be aware of when we get new videos up on here and when we go live and whenever anything else happens. So yeah, drop a comment below, tell us your uh, final four options for the Mount Rushmore and your thoughts on our whole deliberation of this and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, more plugs coming later on. Woo, I know that's what everybody's listening to this for. Let's dive into this with, uh, I guess, just a general idea here. Now, I mentioned before, I do not have a full-on list that I have in mind. Does anybody have an actual, like, oh, these are about, like, the five or so, six or so, whatever, that you're thinking about debating about? Or is everybody kind of in the same boat as me, where it's just like, we'll see how this goes? <laughs> I've got four guys that I'm pretty confident about, but there's two of two or three more where I was debating putting them instead. I've got two names that have to go on for me, but other than that, I'm pretty much open to debate. I sound overly prepared then, as <laughs> as is typically the case with these Mount Rush laws. I have 23 names listed that I've kind of been not so much deliberating over. There's some that stand out of the other ones, but they're kind of like 23 that I think 
cut through the 97 other ones that either I don't know or don't really have a high opinion about. So I guess one way to do this, I don't know if this is really going to be the best way to do it or not, but let's try, is to kind of, I have the, the Wikipedia page open right now. I've got them sorted but, uh, based off of how long their combined reigns have been because I figured, well, what's the likelihood that somebody's got a short reign and one single reign and that they wound up getting into the Mount Rushmore. Um, stop me if you think there is worth uh, a discussion on these names. I want to run down however many of these that we could potentially just go, yep, nope, 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 nope. So, yeah, uh, just go, ah, ah, if, if that's the case. Uh, the lowest is Raven. He was a one-day champion one time, so that's I'm assuming that he's not in the, the running for that. Uh, then there's Edge, uh, Jinder Mahal, Tajiri, Michael Hayes, Terry Funk, Ricochet. Shame that he didn't have a better reign. Uh, Kurt Angle. You would think that they would have given him a longer reign for the United States title based off of the whole Olympics and stuff like that. But I guess they just figured, you know, he's world title material. We're not going to work with that. Uh, Mr. Wrestling. <laughs> uh, Shane Douglas, Bobo Brazil, Steve Mongo McMichael. Never mind that shit. Uh, Seth Rollins, who, funny enough, when I was going through this list in my head, just trying to think of United States champions, I'm like, oh, there's Seth Rollins, whatever. Then I'm like, wait a minute. Seth Rollins only won that as a dual champion, and that really wasn't all that worth it. Uh, Randy Orton, Zack Ryder. That was a shame that he didn't get a better run as well. Rhino, One Man Gang, David Flair. Oh, stop that there, David Flair. Come on. That's yeah, David okay. All right. So David <laughs> Flair. Let's talk about how great he is. Greatest Flair to ever hold the US title. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Until Charlotte wins it in a couple of years. Well, yeah, she's got to run down the list of other things. First, it's, you know, win the 16 times uh, the women's title. Then she needs to be 16 time men's champion. And then she needs to win the Intercontinental. And then she needs to win the United States. She's got a long way to go. But the fact that uh, they've sped her off that fast means that she'll do all those things and the United States title in about, like, you know, like 45 minutes. Something like that. I just uh, realized how annoyed Pete is going to be that we just completely glanced over Zack Ryder. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, so did WWE. I, there you go. Yeah. I always try to. Zack Ryder won that United States title in a big moment, and then WWE was promptly like, yeah, but we don't actually like you, so screw you. And it's a shame, because he deserved he deserved better than that. Debatable. So let me throw out a name that I'm sure we're going to end up talking about, and that's Steve Austin, Stunning Steve, because his time as US champion in WCW was actually worth a damn. And it's one of the only times we get to talk about Austin without talking about, you know, the beer drinking and the middle finger. I think he's definitely in the running for this. I think it's difficult to say really with Steve Austin because I can't say that I have like the most complete knowledge of his time in WCW. I know I assume that when he won it, he would have won it as part of the Dangerous Alliance, but he didn't win it as part of that. He won it as part of something called another stable that's part of them. Stable with uh, uh, Colonel Robert Parker, I think. Yeah, so it's cool. Yeah. So, but it doesn't really stud stable. That's it. That's what they called it. That's a great name. Um, See, I don't put him up there that often. I only just think of the Dragon Slayer thing and the feud with Ricky Steamboat, and it's okay, but it doesn't come to my mind as like Mount Rushmore U.S. champions. Yeah, and he had he had two title reigns with it, even though one of the title reigns lasted about thirty five seconds because he won it well, because due to um, Steamboat forfeiting it, and then lost it immediately to Jim Duggan, and then he was out of the company a couple of months later. So I think actually Steve Austin did better as part of like earlier as part of the dangerous line stuff like that. I think his U S title reign is not, it, it's significant for the time, but that's because I start looking forward beyond Steve Austin and just say, wow, there's a load of shitty people that have held the United States championship. So I think we're thinking more about Steve Austin, Steve Austin, rather than stunning Steve. Well, that's her. And to be totally transparent, I was just trying to, Move the conversation past, you know, David Flair. Um, <laughs> one name I, I really do think, as far as the older people is concerned, would be Lex Luger, because he's held this thing a lot, and he's actually held it for quite a long time. He is the longest combined days. He has uh, 950 days as United States champion over five reigns. 
And he has... is my Teddy Roosevelt pick for Matt Rushmore. He is the guy, like, he's had a lot of reigns, everywhere, but nobody really associates the US title with him. Nobody really wants to talk about him. He was just kind of shit. Uh, I'm and... one of those guys that has not been a big WCW fan ever, so I don't know. Like, you talking about the whole Stunning Steve stuff, like, I don't think I've seen more than one Stunning Steve match, to be perfectly honest. Like, that whole idea that he's feuding with Ricky Steamboat and stuff, I'm like, this is news to me. Like, I do not know those kind of things. So I can't be like, well, Lex Luger had this great match or whatever like that. But I do know of Lex Luger being this big United States champion type thing. And I'm like, to me, if you somebody says Lex Luger, there's a handful of things that I think about. One, I think of the total package joke. I think of the narcissist or the narcissist and all that. I think of like the, his team with uh, British Bulldog. I think of the whole slamming Yokozuna, winning by DQ and think or count yeah, out, and thinking that he's won the title. Thing. You that's know, the number one thing. Like there's there's a list of WWF related things. You know, the Royal Rumble and so on and so forth. But I'm like, you know, I don't really think of WCW yet. If I think of WCW, I think of him holding the United States Championship in just various photos and everything and then him being this like side character doing uh the whole nwo and whatever type of thing where it never really felt like he was like a big focal point so like luger to me if somebody were to say like he's a guarantee i'd be like okay i can i understand that from my limited knowledge i, th I think yeah, the thing I, with I, oh, go on i was gonna say i think the thing with lex is he's not he was never a great wrestler by any stretch of the imagination but he did get over in the nwa to a pretty high degree, not as high as they probably would have hoped for him, but I think he was a victim of bad booking and bad timing. Like the idea that when he just as soon as he was about to rise up to become world champion a few times, like Ric Flair would leave or other thing, other instances would get in his way and would prevent him from like being the top star that he potentially could have been. See, I, I thought bad talent was holding him back. I mean, he was. I th I think I would have agreed with that, but I've seen a lot of people who aren't exactly super talented come forward, whether it's in this era or eras past, and actually just get over. I think Luger never had too much of an issue getting over as either a heel or a babyface. He just, let's put it this way, he wouldn't get over in today's WWE, which is far more work orientated. I think he also had the advantage of, with the NWA being so wrestler heavy he was kind of an attraction and he was a different kind of guy and the reason he always had the u.s title is because they used to take that whole thing seriously where well as long as you have the u.s title you can automatically be given a world title match so luger was always in that slot of i i need to move him up to the world title because you know sting is injured or flair is leaving or whatever and i actually the more we talk about it, the more I think, at the very least, we have to put him in the, like, put a pin in this. He's definitely a consideration. Oh, he's yeah, he's definitely my Teddy Roosevelt spot just because of the sheer amount of time he's held it. If yeah. it wasn't for that, I'd be like, nah. But he's been pretty much a consistent thing in his career. Yeah, oh. I mean, it's not even the fact that the 950 combined days, it's, he has the longest single reign as well. He has a title reign of over 500 days. Like, so it's, so he's basically got two of the big records that you would associate with any championship, and that kind of, I wouldn't say cements him just yet, but he's definitely a top, a front runner for it. It's just shocking, like, how much you can hold a title and no one really associates it there with you that much. Well, we'll talk about Dean Ambrose in a little while. But, yeah. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, it is the type of thing that, like, I, I know a lot of people have a difficulty when it comes to stuff like this, and, like, the we've established in the past, like, Champs Giving, for instance, that it's hard to dissociate what somebody's whole career is versus their time with a particular championship, where it's kind of like they said the other day, Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura, they won the tag titles at uh, Extreme Rules. And this is now the seventh tag team title reign that Cesaro has had. And I was like, holy crap, seven reigns for him? Like, that's a lot. A lot of people don't have seven title reigns and they're tag team specialist people. So, when you think about it, it's like, oh, wow, Cesaro is one of the major tag team people that it's been over the past 10 years or so. And that 
when you like boil it down to those kind of things, somebody like a Lex Luger that a lot of people in a lot of other types of lists would be like, ah, it's Lex Luger. We don't need to put him on there. It's like, well, you know what? If we're limiting this to United States champions, he his value goes significantly higher. Whereas somebody like we were talking about Austin, you know, yeah, you talk about greatest of all times. Austin's up there. Greatest United States champions of all times. No, not necessarily. And you know, I'm sure that some people right now, like uh, that, are fans of like the current product, and they don't really have as much of a knowledge about things in the past. Would be like, what do you mean, like the Seth Rollins or Roman Reigns, for instance? Like, oh, Roman's got 107 days or so. Yeah, but does that make him a best United States champion of all time or something? No, I don't think so. And, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, weird how that's people the case. To- yeah, I would channel those people to name one thing that Roman Reigns did with the United States title, either uh, beyond winning it and then losing it. And this uh, I this can't. championship, <laughs> it's one of those belts where I look through the list of names and there's a lot of Hall of Fame people on there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were great reigns at all. Right. And some people have had some good reigns for whatever they were at the time, but that still doesn't necessarily stack up. Like there is a part of me that goes like, oh, Carlito. Yeah, I I remember Carlito as United States champion pretty fondly. And then I'm like, wait, he's only listed here as 42 days. And I'm like, wow, you know what? That probably was not actually all that important if it was only a month. (laughs) I think his importance was raised up by how big Cena was getting at the time. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, he's there as a, he was a, well, somebody who benefited from circumstance with the fact that Cena was injured and needs to take time off, and so he gets the rub by being the new guy that just debuted, he gets the title for a little while, and then Cena gets it straight back when he's healthy again. Well, we're talking Cena right now, I think he's somebody to bring up for sure. He has had five reigns, which is one of the highest it's tied with uh with luger i think as the most let me double check that resort this so, yeah well there, there there's an element of contention about who has the most because if you go by wwe's history the most anyone's ever had is five and that's shared by about five or six people whereas actually if you go by just the nwa's like, overall history rick flair has six so he has the most in so rick flair's the most winningest united states champion depending on which history you believe Flair's always got those asterisks. It's like he's a 16-time world champion, but more than 16. It's <laughs> it's, 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 for, it's it's throughout that in like the NWO, especially at times when you could get away with just doing results on house shows and you could basically just wreck on them because only the people that were in the building at the time saw it. Mm-hmm. So I've also could... seen get results get murky because like Detroit will have their version of the United States title and then another area will have their version. A lot of bullshit going on. So then we need to do Mount Rushmore versions of the United States. <laughs> well, well, with Cena, at least we've got, we've got one that we're working with. But Cena, I think, is the greatest WWE United States champion. John Cena's on this list, period. Like, he's, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's Cena's, the one guy. Cena's a lock for me for multiple reasons. Are you, he had one of the most perfect US title runs where it actually transitioned into a world title run. You mm-hmm. rarely see that in WWE go smoothly anymore. In addition to that, you've got to take into account the US Open. Mm-hmm. That thing was yeah. awesome. Well, that it's yeah, it's it's two perfect encapsulations of what you, a mid card title can do. It can raise someone up from the mid card into a main event slot, and then it can be a perfect position for a, a veteran main event, well established guy to help bring up some new talent as well. And Cena fulfilled both those roles with two well, within his five brains. That United States Open challenge, the name alone, of course, I like because it's you know kind of punish, but that brought so many people like uh, Sami Zayn, for instance, into this limelight that never would have gotten some kind of big push right out of the gate. Because, I mean, you have like your Kevin Owens feud, you have your uh, like your people from NXT popping up here and there, and you've got people that weren't from NXT, but they just hadn't done anything in a while. And it was kind of a big deal for them to be like, you know what, I think I deserve a United States title shot and everything. And that inspired other people to do the same thing to the point now where if you're a babyface champion and you're holding that United States title and you're not doing something at least somewhat similar, it almost feels like you're not doing the belt justice. Oddly enough, like Apollo Crews hasn't quite done that, but when they had him win the title, he was pretty much like, I'm going to do this open challenge thing and I'm going to defend it all the time and whatever. Of course, COVID gets in the way of that kind of stuff, but We've had plenty of people over the past few years, ever since John Cena's done this, 
that have been like, hey, United States title, I guess that means I'm defending it practically every week. And that means a lot to a championship. If you can not only like uh, serve the belt's purpose as far as what uh, these guys were talking about before when it comes to like a veteran putting other people over or somebody raising uh, their stock to begin with. But I mean, Cena already also flipped the belt itself around just because of how popular he was at the time. And then that became like transitional period where that belt was synonymous with him. And of course it switched over eventually to the design that they had for like 13 years or something like that, or 17 years or whatever it was. So that I think makes it kind of like a lock. John Cena would be in this. Of course we might debate that in the future, but I got a feeling that we're probably all going to agree on Cena at the end of this. I'll go ahead and say that Cena is my lock for number one. If we were doing ranking yeah. that way. I, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know if he's necessarily number one, because I don't like to do that for the Mount Rushmore just because of the thing, but he'd definitely be a contender for the top spot if we would say, say, who's the greatest United States champion of all time? Cena's definitely in the conversation. Absolutely. And and beyond that, like the US Open Challenge basically caused so many fans to do a complete 180 on John Cena as well, yeah. just because he was having so so many good matches with so many new people. I prefer John Cena as a US champion than a world champion, I'll say that. Yeah, I don't think that that's uh, too crazy of a thought. He was having more fun with that kind of a thing than when he was the world champion, and they booked him into the certain corners. The United States Open Challenge gave him the option to wrestle more, to wrestle some different people, to have more flexibility with that kind of stuff. So it is kind of more fun to watch that. Actually, there's more than uh, 97 or so people. I'm looking at this list now because people are doubled up a lot because they're uh, like on par with each other, like uh, Carlito, Mr. Kennedy, Sid. They're all listed as number 76. Uh, I don't think we're talking about Kennedy or Sid or Rick Steiner or anything like that. Um, it's a shame that somebody like a Jack Swagger couldn't have had more of a chance uh, to do anything great. Um, I don't think that somebody like a Finley or a Bobby Lashley would be on this list necessarily. Um, you know, obviously if you disagree, go ahead and stop me. Uh, Bobby Roode for certain to me is not somebody that's in the discussion. Uh, I don't remember a lot of Baron Corbin's reign. A lot of these like more recent things are just kind of pointless. I think I'll tell Okay. As a more recent U S champion, as much as I wouldn't put him on the Mount Rushmore, I enjoyed Bruce Rusev is one of the few. I, I think he's when when I look at the W if it was just a WWE US title reign, then I would say Rusev would be on it. Yeah. Just because I can't think of too many other people. I mean, when you look at the WWE side of the United States Championship, it's a lot of filler. You have Cena, you have Rusev, you have Benoit, who we should probably obviously discuss as well, even though it's difficult to put him on any sort of wrestling related memorial at this point in time. You got the Miz, and I'd be hesitant to put the Miz on there anyway. Miz is more intercontinental to me than the United States. Like, yeah. if we were, and we eventually, of course, we will uh, do the Mount Rushmore of intercontinental champions, I would give serious consideration to putting the Miz on there. The United States, though, no, and I, this sounds kind of stupid, but part of me knocks the Miz off this list because one of those title reigns, he lost the belt to Bret Hart. And Bret Hart is, uh, in his own right, somebody who could be worth a discussion. But that whole thing with Bret winning the championship when he really should not have been doing anything at all and he really couldn't do anything at all, no. <laughs> I didn't at, like the same point, at the same point, though, didn't Cena lose his US title to fucking Orlando Jordan? Yeah. Yes. At the time, Orlando Jordan was looked at as somebody who had some potential, though, right? No, he wasn't. And he was just, everyone thought he was, well, he was just, everyone he, thought he was a terrible wrestler that got stuck with JBL and forced down their throats. Everyone hated him. Well, yeah, well, that's the only reason he won it is because the he was tied with JBL, and so JBL was going to be facing him for the title, and so they gave it on to the lackey. Have JBL interfere, cost him that title, and so he can transition him onto the WWE Championship. And now I just associate him with caution tape and dribbling stuff on him. <laughs> <laughs> well, so he's on the Mount Rushmore, okay. <laughs> we... we <laughs> I mean, he. I mean, the most memorable thing he did with the United States Championship was he lost it to Benoit in was it like twenty five seconds or something at SummerSlam. Yep, and, and then they, they went into that clip a lot. Well, yeah, they went on to a feud after that where it was basically just Benoit beating Orlando Jordan in short and sh shorter and shorter times. 
So I remember the one segment it was Ken Benoit P faster than he beat Orlando Jordan at SummerSlam. I forgot about that. That was actually a little bit of a fun feud. <laughs> what? This was a feud? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this so was ben, in uh, 2005 ish. This yeah. is firmly when you weren't watching, Tony. Then now I wonder why. <laughs> if the feuds can somebody pee with uh, quicker than they beat them. I think huh. it was good comedy, just um, ripping on Orlando Jordan. And Orlando Jordan's easy to rip on. Yeah. There's people in WWE, though, that, like, like for the time or whatever, that, yeah, they might have served a purpose, but, like, I'm looking at the list right now, and it's like, for instance, Kofi Kingston and Dolph Ziggler perennial mid-card type talent where you can interchange when they had the Intercontinental or the United States title where the reigns blur together so much that I can't tell you anything specific about like Kofi as United States champion or Sheamus as United States champion or you know like the, any of the people like Kevin Owens you know his time as United States champion was a little bit different because it tied into the whole you know, WrestleMania and Goldberg and all that other kind of stuff. But uh, like Kofi and Ziggler, like fantastic in a lot of ways. And I'm sure at the time I probably was like, oh, these guys are great or whatever. But like as much as I like the two of them, I don't think they are Mount Rushmore-ish. Well, I think to qualify for this Mount Rushmore, you had to at least have done something with the championship that people remember. Yeah. And that or even implies yeah. for somebody like AJ Styles to me, where I'm like, you know, I can't really remember AJ having anything that memorable, and this wasn't that long ago. I love Styles, but I associate the X Division title with him before I do anything. I think it has yeah. more uh, WWE stock because of his like year long title reign than the United States one, in my mind. Has he not been Intercontinental? Oh, God, he's the Intercontinental, he's Intercontinental champion, champion now. He's the... Wow. <laughs> yeah. As soon as it started coming out of my mouth, I'm like, oh my God, he's holding the title right now. He's now been tag champion. <laughs> huh. Oh yeah, yeah. The OC never won, and they never did. So he's not a Grand Slam champion just yet. Huh. Oh, hopefully that'll change. I don't know what, what uh, tag team partner he'll get, but if we'll only they haven't the... released two of their ta- two of his tag team partners in the earlier this year. They'll put him and Balor together when they decide that they don't want to push either of them anymore. <laughs> and they'll be like, "Hey, look at that! You're you're uh, whatever yeah. we can do that isn't Bullet Club." Um. Yeah, a lot of WCW guys, though, should be in the mix here and stuff. And I'm sure that a lot of people that have followed the NWA and WCW to even like, uh, you know, double the amount that I have or, you know, significantly more than that could talk about like Barry Windham or Magnum TA. I was going to say Magnum TA is a weird one because like I always hear about how awesome this guy was and how he was going to be the next big thing before he got injured. But I've not seen enough of his work where I can speak to, was he a great U.S. champion? Well, I don't know if he was a great U.S. champion. He was the guy, kind of like Luger, where he was getting that belt because they were going to transition him into being the world champion. But I will say, as far as NWA stuff is concerned, Magnum T.A., Tully Blanchard, Starcade in the I Quit match is probably my favorite NWA U.S. title match. But I don't know if either one of them would make this Mount Rushmore. Talking about him to go on. I was gonna say it's interesting because he's a bit of a trailblazer in that he was the first person to win a United States Championship, not at a house show. He actually won it on a TV or a, a televised show, and he won it at Starcade as well. He's the first person to win it at Starcade, so he does have those sort of elements going for him as well. So he's the best. Why Callum is here. <laughs> I can read Wikipedia. That's kind of my, that's kind of what my addition to this is. Uh, you mentioned like WCW, that side of things. I actually looked at like the list of WCW and did some number crunching. So between April nineteenth, nineteen ninety eight, and March eighteenth, two thousand one, not a single United States champion held that title for over a hundred days. And there were twenty seven championship reigns within those three years, when there had been sixty two reigns in the previous twenty three years. So it's like that final three years of WCW, as we all know, was just an absolute shit show. And I don't even think that there's only one champion that I'd even consider from that period of time potentially being on the Mount Rushmore, and that's Goldberg. What about Ric Flair? Flair won it in 96. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm talking about like that short period of WCW where basically... Okay, strictly WCW, sorry, because... I always get confused with Jim Crockett promotions. Oh, no, yeah. I, no, there's, I think like there's a point where 
I was like reading through all of them and I'm thinking, okay, there's a few people that I can mention from like pre 1996 or anything like that. And then there's a period of like, oh, maybe John Cena in WWE and a few other people. And then there's just a huge vacuum of just nobodies who just held the title for like two weeks or whatever and then just moved on to the next guy, like General Rection <laughs> and, and Raven, as we've mentioned, and like just just loads of completely uninteresting people D- in ddp didn't have a good reign with the united states title probably the one that is the most interesting or the one that i can remember the best from what i've watched back of wcw is lance storm but that's only because he changed it into the canadian championship and at least he did something memorable though it's not yeah. like wahoo mcdaniel who's got five reigns and no one could say a goddamn thing about it it's weird for that wahoo thing well, that's a stretch well, the weird thing about the Wahoo one is because we talk about like Cena as the veteran. He won every single one of his United States titles after he'd reached the age of forty. Hmm. So he was like had already like had a very very long career before even winning his first championship, and then he won five others like when he's in his like mid forties, which I guess would be typical now for WWE like just give Randy Orton or John Cena another reign with the championship. But yeah, it's I I don't I can't remember anything memorable. But then again, I wasn't a big I wasn't watching at that time, so. And nothing really sticks out. Like I don't really hear people talk about Wahoo well, McDaniel was like this really extensive United States champion. So everyone got Flair on their list? He's got to be in the consideration just because of the amount of times that he's won it. And yeah, it was like the thing that helps cement him before he became... I don't know if he had actually won a world title before that, but... No, he, he didn't. So that's actually why I liked his reign, because... Obviously, I'm looking all back on this historically, but it would seem to be one of those great examples of a mid-card title actually elevating someone into the main event. You know, what it's there for. Yeah, abs- absolutely. I, I like Ric Flair's a good consideration for that, or just due to the amount of times he's won it. But I was also thinking Harley Race as well. And I know that's an easy one to go with because he's the first United States champion. So it makes it seem like, oh, like George Washington's the first president, Harley Race's the first champion. That seems to fit. But... He would have already been a world champion, I think, when he won it. But I feel like it was a better position for him to win it just because it helps establish the title when someone who's actually worth a damn wins it the first time. But when Flair wins it, it's better because he's a young dude who hasn't won a world championship, helps elevate him, makes him more memorable by the time he does win the world championship. So I think both of them are in consideration at the very least. I, if we were just debating those two, I'd go with Flair over Harley because... Harley is the first champion, but he doesn't seem to hold on to it for a while. And with Flair, he's one of the very few people who went from TV championship to um, the U.S. title to the world title. And he does actually have decent reigns with them. But uh, going back to what you were saying about the 98 to 2001 time period, I think you mentioned Goldberg. The only name that stands out for me is Booker T because Mm -hmm. he's the last WCW United States champion and he's somebody who again that belt elevated him to the main event level well you you do say that but he won his first United States championship after he'd already been a four-time W a three-time WCW champion so he he, he's like his first reign with WCW champion with the United States title is the final reign as WCW United States champion the only 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 reason Oh, and like then he gave it champion. I think I've like when I was checking through the stats and stuff like that, he only yeah, he won it the first time was his was the final reign. And the only reason he held it for 112 days because WW was dead and he wasn't picked up by WWE until a couple of months later. Well so. then fuck me, never mind what I said. <laughs> and then I think he Booker, gave the title to Canyon, right? Just yeah, on exactly. an episode of Raw. I think Booker T it sounds like someone who should be on this list, but I think his reigns are greatly over-exaggerated in terms of their quality. He had that yeah. decent feud with Benoit, but that's about it, really, when he was well, United States so, You want about uh, the Best of Seven series? Yeah, that's about it. And and the Best of Seven series, three Didn't of those matches were by Randy Orton. Matches? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah if I remember well, he, right, he did like, do the Best they... of Five with John. He got some good matches in with John. I just remember like them advertising the best of seven being this thing they did in WCW that was amazing, and then they brought it to SmackDown and it completely shit the bed. See that t- that best of seven in WCW, I think, wasn't even for a championship, or if it was for a title, it was for the television championship. So it was for a shot at the television championship. I mean, you talk about Benoit's one. Benoit in WCW, I think he held it like a couple of times. I know he's the one that I think he's the one that beat Flair, David Flair for it. 
but I think he's got like two reigns WW and they're both combined to about like 20 or 30 days. Like, if we were to put him on this Mount Rushmore, it would only be for his WWE work. I'm kind yeah, because uh, his WWE ran was pretty good. I'm kind of like trying to think about the, the WCW people where, back when I was watching it because I remember like Goldberg winning the United States title on his way to win the world title and all that. And I'm like, you know what? Like, okay, there's Jeff Jarrett. Well, I don't really remember a whole lot much about Jeff Jarrett as the United States champion. And there's like the around like the Chris Benoit type of era. Then I don't really remember any of that. And then looking through right now, like Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, like, you know, obviously great competitors at different times and stuff, but I'm like, I don't remember anything like that. I don't remember, uh, you mentioned DDP. I don't remember Scott Hall being champion. I don't remember Roddy Piper being champion. Like, that stretch when I would have been watching WCW is just not memorable as far as United States champions go. So, would, would just anyone could have been the anyone could have been United States champion at that point in time because the belt didn't matter. It didn't mean anything. I mean, during that time period, the title was vacated six times. Hmm. That's that that three year stretch that I was talking about. Six times it was vacated. It's just like this. The title was absolutely nothing. David Flair held it. Um, Goldberg and Chris Benoit and Terry Funk held it for one day at a time. You had a long-standing feud between Lance Dawn and General Rection over the championship. It's like it, it meant an absolute shit. You think Big Show is worth discussing? Since he's the guy who he beat Eddie Guerrero, he lost to John Cena at WrestleMania 20. He had it for 147 days. He, he gets mentioned in for it just because it helped elevate Cena for winning it at WrestleMania and beating somebody who'd been established like the Big Show. I think I think that period of Big Show is actually one of his better periods in WWE where they're actually trying to push him and trying to make him seem like a monster. Like, he basically just ran roughshod in the 2004 Royal Rumble before yeah, Benoit eliminated on, him. He was on fire then, because, like, they even had made they even did a finish with, for that match, which I love, where he felt like a giant, where Cena had to hit him with the chain first before he hoisted him up for the attitude adjustment. I think he was the first person to kick out of the attitude adjustment as well in that match as well. So they did they did build him up pretty strong. But it's just a one reign, and I guess he was just like the big guy who's there to bridge between Eddie Guerrero on his rise up to the WWE Championship and John Cena to get the new guy over. So he he did a he performed his function well. I just don't think that's enough to really be on Mount Rushmore. Looking at some of these other random names, uh, Alberto random Del Rio, names. no, uh, no, Chris Jericho. Not that Kalisto. I think of well, good, have a good lucha thing on. <laughs> well, how about the kind of current US champion MVP? MVP should be on this list. MVP got, has to be in the discussion. I've got fond memories of MVP as champion. Um, I remember his feud with Benoit, which I like. I think he ended up beating Benoit in two straight falls, which surprised me at the time. Yeah. I've always lo- I've always liked him as a champ. I've always liked him as a character, and. When I think of the WWE version of the US title, not the new one, I actually associate that design with MVP. He's, he's one of the longest holders of it. Right. He has only held it twice, but he's held it for 419 days. And he did some stuff with that United States title that made it seem like he was trying to actually boost the credibility of the championship and himself at the same time. To the point where, despite only having two title reigns and only having half as much of the time as somebody like Lex Luger in the combined reigns, when MVP has started this whole thing about, well, I'm the greatest United States champion of all time and I'm going to make my own belt, somebody like me at the very least who doesn't have this big tie into NWA and WCW, I'm like, oh yeah, of course, because MVP is definitely one of the best. And it's like you start getting into the more like, okay, talk about Nikita Koloff, talk about uh, Ricky Steamboat and stuff, then you're going to start maybe punching some holes in the theory, but like, I can't tell you anything about Greg, the hammer Valentine as champion, but I can tell you MVP as the United States champion was pretty great from me watching it. And so I he's on my probably list. got good memories of that feud with Matt Hardy. It was so good. Yeah. That was a really good feud for something that really, in a lot of ways didn't necessarily need to be. And I, I put MVP on that list with the whole, like, it'll be hard to knock them off kind of thing. As WWE United States champions go, for me, it's Cena and MVP. And 
I, I really don't even see a lot of people on the WCW side who can kind of overtake what MVP did with that belt. See, maybe I'm just like blocking it out of my mind or whatever but the only things that i recall with mvp being united states champion are him beating ben moore into straight falls and the feud leading up to that and then that feud with matt hardy and then everything else is just a blur that's because the feud with matt hardy lasted so long oh yeah the feud did last like a long time and it was it was it was definitely good it was really entertaining tv but his certainly with his second reign his second reign is just nothing and also i think mvp was united states champion and defended against Batista when Batista said the infamous basketballs don't hold grudges. <laughs> so there you go. Well, I, I just go with the um, the second reign because I think he won that championship off the back of a really long losing streak. Because they, they definitely booked him for a while after losing that you know, I say title for the first time. He would just lose matches to people like Kazani. And people like that yeah. and just this this lengthy fucking Kazani. Jesus, I've not heard yeah. that name in forever. Yeah, he only just, wrestled, what, he, three matches? He wrestled one match yeah. on television. Yeah, and he beat MVP in one of them, so that shows you what they were doing with MVP, like, post his first United States Championship reign. But, yeah, I just, I, I feel like he's definitely within the conversation. I just wouldn't feel... I'm, I'm not as dead set on him being on it just because he, out of the WWE list of people, which we've already discussed is pretty thin, that he was one of the better ones. Well, hey, if you want more Kazarni talk, one way that you can make sure that we do is yes. donate to the Patreon. Uh, there's a pick your poison tier on there where you can request whatever special feature you would like, within reason, of course. And, uh, you know, maybe you want us to do a fan outs table of Kazarni's one and only appearance or <laughs> I'm going go to right gonna go on the record right now and say that's unreasonable. <laughs> Nothing with Kazarni. Well, I, mean, I don't know. Like... I think a superstar scores would be really great. <laughs> I always thought Kazarni, I don't want to go down this uh, rabbit hole too much, but I always thought that Kazarni had a gimmick that could have been like the new doink and it just happened to be on the wrong person for it. So I, you know, there's a part of me that wants to do like uh, a rebooking or like a repackaging or something like that of Kazarni as like some new gimmick or fantasy booking or something like that. I don't know, but I'm not going to get a chance to do it unless the the Patreons (laughs) coming in the factor. It's just all I'm saying it spoiled my pick for Christian's one last match. Ah. <laughs> well, like I said, Patreon, that is a way for you to make sure that we do certain things on the side and I actually have the time to dedicate to it. So even if uh, it's just a dollar that you donate, it goes a long way. It means quite a bit. Uh, $10 and up gives you access to the Dark Cast tiers, which are the uh, Patreon exclusive episodes of the show. So if you want to show more support for this whole podcast and this website and everything else like that, and you got the spare change, then consider tossing it through the Patreon. Obviously, let me just uh, roll along here along with that. If you want to do the same thing when it comes to fanboysanonymous.com, then go ahead and do that. Fanboys is my geek culture website for movie reviews and topics on the geek culture spectrum, you know, TV shows, comic books, video games, all that other kind of stuff. So if you want more of that, the Patreon for that is the best way to make sure that that happens. And if you are still looking at your wallet and finding some spare change and you want to toss it in a different way, then there are the merchandise shops on TeePublic and Redbubble. If you search Fanboys Anonymous, Smart Cat Moment, and A Mango Tees, you can check a whole bunch of different designs. You can check out a whole bunch of merch options for those designs and then, uh, you know, pick up a mask or a t-shirt or something like that. Yeah, a couple of those plugs out of the way. Uh, let's talk about... Ooh, let's see here. We got Cesaro. I don't think he's really worth talking about. Uh... uh Dustin Rhodes, uh, I don't know if anything with that is really in the mix there. I don't think that the natural is somebody that people are going to be like, yeah, that's a... actually let's lump these two guys together. Um, Sergeant Slaughter and Jim Duggan. Now, there are these weird things with these championships where some things are so generic that there's no real need to like build around somebody for like a gimmick. Like, you know, the Intercontinental Championship, anybody can win the Intercontinental Championship and you just happen to create your own lineage out of it. Like, I think somebody like Mr. Perfect when I think of the Intercontinental title, but it doesn't have to be anybody in particular. Somebody like a Rusev or a John Cena, Lex Luger to a certain extent, so on and so forth, can take the United States title and take that United States aspect to it and make something out of it. Lance Storm turning it into the Canadian Championship and etc. But... 
Duggan and Slaughter are these USA type guys. And it's like, yeah, of course they should win the United States title at some point, right? Like, that's something that's, if it wouldn't have happened, it would have seemed weird. And between the two, I see online a lot more support of Jim Duggan being higher up on that than Sergeant Slaughter. Anybody have any kind of opinions about that? I don't really know anything about any of the title reigns themselves, so I don't have a horse in this race, but it seems to be that that's the case. I don't think that either one will get too far in the actual discussion of Mount Rushmore, but I know that when Jim Duggan held the belt, it was during WCW's worst time, so I can't imagine that his reign was better than Sergeant Slaughter in the NWA. What what you call is WCW's worst time. Well, like the we just signed Hogan, so everything is going to be like '80s rehash. Well, that that's that's quite that's probably like, that's kind of a lot of period where WCW was absolutely crappy. But I, the, the Jim Duggan one, I don't know too much about. The Sergeant sort of Slaughter one is weird because you would assume that he'd be a, like the super ultra American babyface being United States champion. I'm pretty sure he was heel for both of his title runs because he beat Ricky Steamboat in the uh, final f- of the tournament for it. And Ricky Steamboat's always been a perennial babyface, so I assumed he was heel winning it. And, yeah, I, I can't really say that I know too much about either Reign to really be super cemented with like either of them being it. I know they're so associated with America, but I think that's more like a WWE trait than the WCW stuff or NWA stuff. What was uh, Duggan's WCW theme? What, you uh... wanted to sing it? That like that patriotic theme, you know. Dun 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 dun. You know, uh, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. Nobody knows the name of these songs. <laughs> it's never just like, oh, that's uh, you know, like pomp and circumstance or like those kind of things. I only know that because obviously it's pomp and circumstance or Macho Man. But yeah, I'm just like to me, like for even something like that, like it's weird to hear like American made or something like that for Hogan or whatever. It's just a, there's a disconnect in my brain. Not a WCW guy. That's why I can't tell you anything about like a uh, black check Mulligan. He is the third longest uh, time as champion, 509 days, uh, 500 uh, recognized days. But like, I can't tell you a single thing about black check Mulligan and the United States championship. That that shocked me of how long that he's held the United States Championship, considering that you just always associate him as a tag team guy with the Blackjacks. Right. So just to see that he went, like he left, because this was post the Blackjacks, he went to NWA and then he just held the United States title for so long. I just, I didn't really seem that, like him being that big of a single star post his WWE run, but I guess like good on him for holding it that long, but I can't remember any, I can't remember or find anything online that really gives me any sort of insight into how good of a champion he was. Let's see here. We uh, talked about the Miz, talked about uh, these guys, guys. Sting, anything out there for Sting? He had two uh, really unmemorable reigns. He won for some reason, I feel like he was the perennial US champion after they signed Hogan. Because they're just like, all right, Sting, we don't need you. Here's the middle... It's interesting, he won both reigns in tournament matches, so he basically won both titles after it had been vacated. So he was like a guy, like, okay, so we've had to get rid of the guy who actually wanted to be champion, let's give it to Sting. That's that's, that's kind of... He's uh, a man called Sting, you know? So man I don't remember <laughs> But yeah, I don't have anything like seriously to bring to the table for him as well. I would like to talk about Nikita Koloff. Because his reign is interesting because he's... It's one of those ones where he pivoted from heel to babyface because when he started as the US champion, he was, you know, the Russian heel, hate Amer- all hate America, that sort of thing. I think he was teaming up with like Khrushchev and other Ru- Russians at the time. And then he transitioned into being a babyface because during his reign, uh, Gorbachev became pretty popular. And so Dusty Rhodes, who was booking the NWA at the time, decided, OK, so Russians are cool now. So we'll make this Russian guy a babyface instead. And yeah, moreover, it was, oh shit, Magnum TA can't wrestle anymore. Oh yeah, obviously, because yeah. the, the idea was they were going to build towards a rematch between those two eventually, but Magnum TA goes, and so Nikita Koloff it slips in as like, the new baby face who might challenge the Four Horsemen and battle other people. I think I think if we had been around at that time, we would have been more like watching NWA at that point in time. We remember Nikita Koloff's reign a lot more fondly, even though it's only one, but it was nearly a year long. 
So I feel, I feel like I could go back in time, watch that stuff and feel like it, it, it almost feels more memorable, even though I've got no real frame of reference for it. I don't know what it is about that. Yeah, I'm looking at this list and I'm like, you know what? I have no talking points for everybody else that we have had on here. Like, I don't even know who Dick Slater is. And I can't tell you anything about Vader as champion. Can't tell you anything about uh, Johnny Valentine, uh, Paul Jones. Uh, yeah, so. I didn't know Paul Jones as a manager. I never. I, I knew he'd been a wrestler beforehand. I just didn't know he'd actually won things that were worth anything. I don't even remember Santino being champion. Like, yeah, he, 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 he beat champion he, a lot, I think. We well, he, he beat Swagger. He, I think he only has one reign as US champion, but he only he beat Swagger for it and then lost it to Cesaro when he was still uh, Antonio. Yeah, didn't he lose it on the the pre-show? The oh, SummerSlam Slam, yeah. kickoff. Yep, yeah. that I remember. That's... That was back when Cesaro st- still had a first name and then had Exana as, as his manager. Mm. Yeah, so that's forgettable. <laughs> So then that kind of means that we sort of have at least a working list of some well, people to go on. around, we can't right? not talk about Dean Ambrose. I mean, we can. I'd, I'd rather avoid it. I mean, yeah. he, he pretty much didn't talk about the fact that he was United States champion for his whole time. Nobody else did, so why should but we did he hold it for like a year and just, just held he, it, literally? He had 351 days. Yeah. I think he defended it like five times. I watched him. I watched one of the defensive live against Ziggler at Night of Champions, and it was shit. And that pretty much summarizes his entire title reign. Yeah, he it's... won it from Kofi. He won. It, he ended one of Kofi's unmemorable reigns as United States Champion, and lost it in a battle royal to Sheamus. I think it was. It's strange when you come in as a trio, and there seems to be this idea of like, okay, the trio is going to back up CM Punk, and they're just going to be his stable mates. And then it turns into, oh, no, they're just, like, kind of by themselves. But let's try to figure out who is going to be the leader and the standout. Okay, let's give the United States title to this Dean Ambrose guy. That guy is going to be whatever. And the other two are going to be the tag team champions. And then as he's champion, the two other guys start overtaking him. And it becomes, like, the single guy is the guy that nobody's paying attention to. It's weird. Because, like, when I think about that, I think of U.S. champion Dean Ambrose. That was forgettable. Oh, tag team Shield. They had that awesome uh, match with freaking the Rhodes, the Rhodes brothers. Yeah, yeah. It's like co- complete different parallels of what they accomplished. I, th- I think, yeah, I think his issue was the fact that the Shield was so heavily marketed as a, a trip, like a three man package, that there was never really any room for him to have singles matches to defend the United States Championship or have like big singles feuds because it was always just about what the three members of the Shield were doing. And he opened up opportunities for Roman and Seth because they were tag champions. If they're always having six-man tags or tag team matches, it means that you can't defend the United States Championship. Yeah, he mainly just ran interference and did a fist bump and had nothing else to do. It was a real crap rain. He got his ass intimidated by uh, Dusty Rhodes in that tag match with the the Rhodes brothers, so maybe Rhodes should have won the uh, title instead. Empress lost it to Sheamus, right? Yeah, he won, mm-hmm. it, was a, it was a battle royal. It was like the authority attacking the uh, Shield. I think it was either prior to or post-WrestleMania. And so Sheamus won it in a, a battle royal match. And then didn't they try and make Sheamus super babyface? And they're like, all right, let's make his gear red, white, and blue. Or was that a different title reign? No, I don't. He, he no, yeah, I think that was it. Red, and blue gear. He'd already been he'd already been like a babyface for a while. He was he was stagnating as a babyface when he won the U.S. title. And then that and led to Rusev, I think, right? Yeah, Rusev just, was one to beat him for it. Yeah. I just remember Sheamus having a U.S. title reign where he switched his gear up, and it was really awkward. He's had it's two or three reigns with the title, so but none of them are particularly memorable. And the only one that's in any way memorable for any reason is that they got bumped from the WrestleMania card, and their and they're, even their kickoff show match got turned into a lumberjack match that or lump or is a battle royal, I think that Great Carly won, not for the championship. Yeah. <laughs> that shows how much the uh, US title was valued at that point. Well, that. I mean, at that point, we have at least a couple of people on this list. Um, I don't think that there's anybody that we haven't talked about that we would bring in the discussion, right? Uh, well, we, I don't think we, so. We, I'm pretty sure I have by four at this point. We only had a like, cursory mention of Bret Hart, but I wouldn't even put him on this thing. It's just, it's kind of depressing him being United States champion all those times when uh, he won it five times in the space of like two years or whatever. And it was just four times yeah, in two years like, and then one time from the Miz. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So just, yeah, he didn't really do anything. None of those reigns were long or memorable. 
think it was probably one of those reigns where he probably had that feud with that guy from Mad TV or whatever it was. The guy from Mad TV. Will I can't remember. Yeah, Will Sasso, yeah. He had a feud with Will Sasso? Yeah. No, well, Will Sasso helped Roddy Piper beat Bret Hart. You And you would say those names, and you'd think this would be more of a prevalent thing. But it's not. He had a match with Will Sasso. Did he? Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Will Sasso was, like, one of the standouts on Mad TV, but there's a big difference between, like, DDP and, like, basketball stars and Hogan and all this kind of stuff to be in, like, well, we got the guy from Mad TV to fight Rick uh, no, Ric Flair, uh, Bret Hart for the uh, United States title or something, and that's, uh, wow, yeah, okay, I wonder what her WCW went down. No wonder Bret Hart's WCW reign just sucked. Mm. So at least by my calculations, the names that we had discussed that were sort of in the the realm of discussion were in no particular order: John Cena, Lex Luger, MVP, Rusev, and Ric Flair. I'm not missing anybody else, right? Wow, well, you we really leveled it down to five. So, geez, I'm like, let's not even uh, right at play that point. This. Knock off Rusev. There's your four at the end. Yeah, I've got Flair, MVP, Cena, and Luger as mine. Yeah, that's mine. It makes sense. <laughs> it, doesn't matter, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. What I think. <laughs> Why? But I, I would personally go Ric Flair, Lex Luger, Lex Luger, Luger, <laughs> Yeah, Lex Luger. <laughs> oh my god! Now I'm just picturing him just looping things. Hey, you you always wonder. You always wonder why he got so greasy coming to the ring. That makes so much more sense. <laughs> it just goes back to the narcissist gimmick. He's just yeah. in the mirror, just. <laughs> Covering himself as Lou before coming to the room. <laughs> Can we call him no, that from now on? I'm, I'm fine with him. Just calling him that from now. Lex Luber. <laughs> I uh, uh, I'm 12 again. Uh, so, Ric Flair, Lex Luger. I would, I'd personally go into Kia Kolov and then, uh, then John Cena. I don't uh, even, go, even go Rusev over MVP, but if, if MVP's like the consensus, then he can go on. Yeah, I, just, you know, like, I'll, I don't I'll... know anything about Nikita Kolov. I mean, I would love to be able to say right. I know something he did, but See, I, I don't. don't. I don't know anything specifically. I just know that I should know, and that's pro- that, that's like some sort of just force that's carrying me forward on. <laughs> just like to- I like title runs where something happens, and the fact that he transitioned from being like this top level mid card heel into being like this new up and coming baby face during like a single title reign just makes me feel like at least something happened of consequence during that reign. But he loses it to Luger because Luger is four horsemen? Yeah. Okay, all right. That's kind of... That plays into war games and stuff. I kind of like that. But, yeah, MVP seems to be the consensus, so I don't have too many qualms in that. I could see an argument for Russo over MVP. and I, I just think Russo's one was more memorable. But maybe but, that's because it's more recent. But I also kind of feel like Rusev's, uh reign the most memorable kind of aspects to it was the fact that it was John Cena feuding with him. And that kind of puts a little bit more stock into Cena to me. So okay. I'm like, well, you know what? Like we have more votes for MVP and MVP is somebody who I think of when I think of the United States title. I did really enjoy the Matt Hardy feud. I'm currently enjoying what he's doing right now. I mean, he is also, you got to factor in like if John Cena is responsible for changing the, the design, making the whole spinner belt and all that. MVP is being the guy that they are putting this new championship on as far as being like, he's the one who instigates this new title design. So for there's going to be a certain level of whether he wins the title or not, there's going to be a little bit of that for me that's going to go, okay, this is MVP's belt. Especially now that they're in this weird circumstances where they couldn't just give it to Apollo again. So they're like, the more that... Th- MVP is holding this title without even holding it. The more that I'm like, this is becoming MVP's belt. And how do you, just curious, how would you do that? Like the only thing I'm thinking of is ladder match both belts. I was thinking that that could be an option, but I was thinking more so just because it's like kind of a middle finger that if the match would have happened at Extreme Rules, that Apollo Crews would have won, and he would have just he- grabbed that title and been like, I-, I like this one, yeah, I'm going to carry this one now too, to rub it in his face. And then they could have followed it up with, hey, Lashley, you go take that championship back and get that back from me. And then it's Lashley versus Crews at SummerSlam. Now that I mean, we don't have Crews available, I don't know if they're just going to push the MVP thing or... 
I don't know, but they I could think... do some kind of thing that like they could just do something as simple as just say the winner gets that belt and we just don't acknowledge it. You know, WWE does that kind of weird shit every once in a while. I think it'd be a good idea to do like the the Razor Ramon Shawn Michaels type ladder match for it, and then you just transition the belts over. I just don't know whether they'll do a ladder match at SummerSlam because they've already got that takeover ladder match scheduled. So, and they tend to try and avoid like duplicating that stuff. Yeah, but if you think about it, they did like for the past two, three, three years now. They've done War Games the night before Survivor Series. That's true. So I mean, it, it'll be interesting though because I'd be. Pretty fascinating to see what Apollo Crews and MVP can do in a ladder match. I think Apollo Crews would be fine. I'm more worried about what MVP would have be able to well, do. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that's kind of my issue with that as well. Is like he's, he's nearly he's, fifty, right? Yeah, and he's a bit chunky now. Yeah, he's fifty. I'd be surprised. He's, he's around about that age. Yeah. No, he can't be. Right. Well, yeah, it would make sense I thought, actually. I thought I thought he was forty six or forty seven. He is forty six. Oh, he's 46. Okay. Well, he's a bit younger then. So, but he's but still like, he still he wasn't even meant to be come coming back as like a full time wrestler. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so then he just like all hands the bomb, just put him in a ladder match with Apollo Crews. He pops him at the Royal Rumble, then he wrestles a really shitty match with Rey Mysterio, and it's like, oh, that's it. That's my my swan song. And they're like, hey, can you come back and kind of like cut some promos? Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Hey, by the way, when you're cutting those promos, can you wrestle a full time schedule? <laughs> So, yeah, that seems to be the case. Uh, the United States Championship MVP does got uh, a lot going for him, and he is right now possibly in the mix to have a third reign and carry that lineage on even further. So it seems our list is uh, in no particular order. Ric Flair, MVP, Lex Luger, and John Cena with a little asterisk that Rusev almost got into the mix there and some other people like Nikita Koloff or people that if we knew more about, I'm sure that we'd have more of a discussion about those things and be like, you know, I saw this one time at the sportatorium that whatever. And like, I came in super confident about Booker T and then Callum just shit all over me. <laughs> That's what kind of what I do. <laughs> so if you agree, you disagree, maybe you're somebody who's like, how the hell did you not put, um, I don't know, the Andrade on this list or what's the lack of a discussion for Samoa Joe about or whoever, I don't know. General Erection. Um, then, you know, drop a comment below. a great tag team partner for Lex Luber. <laughs> that would have worked out really well. Wonder who's going to use the finishing move, the fluffer, in that. Uh, but, yeah, uh, I think I did most of my plugs. Uh, I didn't plug everything, though. One thing I didn't plug is right now, at the very least, we're still doing the finals of the Sexy Superstars tournament. So if you think that... Uh, I don't know if I should follow anything up with Lex Luber in that way. <laughs> That's probably not the best way to do it, but go ahead and vote on the uh, men's bracket and the women's bracket on that, and check out all the other things that are happening on smartcatmoment.com. Check out the other things that are scheduled for this week. For instance, we got the hot tags coming up. We got the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast, which I'm going to transition over to Callum to tell you a little bit about. Yeah, so this uh, Saturday we're going to have episode five, I believe, of the Paul Heyman Smackdown podcast. So if you've been following the series so far, check all those that episode out. And if you haven't seen any of the other stuff already, go back in the uh, playlist, I think, on the Smart Government channel. You can check out all the episodes there, catch up completely. And also, we've already mentioned the Patreon, but there is a Dark Cast episode where me and Rob review Vengeance 2002 as well. So you can check out that and check out those and make sure that you're staying tuned on the uh, Dark Cast feed. So we'll have both SummerSlam this month and Global Warning. So you get two for the price of one. Over to Rob. That's right. And uh, if you want to continue supporting me, not only check out that podcast, but you can check out Fightful and WrestleZone, which is where I work throughout the week, breaking down all the wrestling news and whatnot. And... Yeah, that's about it for me. Wego? All right. You can follow me at Stephen Wego on Twitter. I've got some gaming streaming coming up. Um, don't know what I'm doing yet because I've got COVID right now. So if you want to feel sorry for me, give me a follow at Stephen Wego. Dropping that bombshell. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, you can follow me at Tony Mango at, of course, all these different things like Fanboys and On and uh, Smart Out Moment and at a Mango uh, Tree and at whatever and at this and at that. There's like 20 different Twitter accounts that I have. Some of them have absolutely nothing on them. Some of them are just uh, placed in the future and we'll get around to them when we get around to it. A couple of ideas. And uh, 
I, of course, got everything on eWrestling News and Bleacher Report, so check that out. Anytime that that happens, I have things posted on Twitter about that. It's just an automated feed. So, you know, next time it pops up, it says, hey, my latest article for this is up or whatever like that. Pay attention to that. SmartCatMama.com, of course, has things happening constantly. And then, of course, we've got next week's worth of podcasts and different things like that. Um, I mentioned the fact that we have the hot tags and we have the uh, Paul Heyman Smackdown uh, podcast coming up. But we also have a dark cast, most likely, that's going to be coming up where we're going to be talking about that sexy Superstars tournament, just kind of breaking down the whole thing. And then I haven't quite decided what the main event for next week is going to be because we don't really have anything that we have to do necessarily. But over the course of the next few weeks, we have some ideas that we might be playing around with. Uh, some of them, of course, are dependent upon if anything pops up and changes it. But we've got potentially another episode of Play the Game. Maybe we just do that just for a little bit of fun. We could try to do something with Wrestling is 2020. We could try to do the AEW roster tier list. Maybe do a Wrestling with a Past about something. If Christian pops back up, we might do a superstar scores or a one more match for Christian. One of the things that was suggested for this week was a Mount Rushmore of NXT. And I think that the week before TakeOver 30, we might do a top rope list and do the new format of that, which I've been playing around with a little bit. So we might have the men's, women's, and overall top 10 for NXT uh, to kind of equal a total of 30 for NXT TakeOver 30. Obviously, when we get to TakeOver and we get to SummerSlam, we will do our predictions for that. But we got a lot of ideas that are cooking. And if anything happens that leads us in one direction or another, then you'll find out about that. And those things will be up on the website and up on the channel. So hit that subscribe button, ring that little notification bell. And when things get up, then you'll see. And then uh, hopefully you'll enjoy those too. Hopefully you enjoyed this. And yeah, I think that's it. So thanks for listening to this, everybody. And we will see you next time. But for now... This has been another Smart Out moment, and we're being counted out.